Hey there, BCers. This is Mrs. Lemke, and I get to just talk to you for ages today about inverse trig derivatives and integrals. Ooh, does the word ages have you concerned? Yeah, I'm a little concerned too. This is going to be a lot of math, but you know what? That's something to be thankful for, not sad about. All right, so we're going to start out here. I have a picture of the sine curve in red, and I have my good old friend y equals x in blue. And I know that when I reflect something over the line y equals x, I get an inverse. So let's just remember that that is how inverses work. And then we get things like this, right? See, I have no courage at all. I, I know I can't draw, so I just make, pic you know, steal pictures off the interwebs. Okay, so here's our arc sine function. And just to confuse you, the red curve is now like in blue after it reflects, just to mess with your brain. Um, and you can see that if we were to take this entire curve that waves from side to side going up and, you know, vertically, that's not a function of x, right? It wouldn't pass the vertical line test, if you want to think of it that way. Any one given input would have multiple outputs. Any one given X would have multiple Y's. And so this is a problem that you encountered back in the day of math analysis. And the way that that's solved is by saying, hey, we're not going to look at any of this. We're just going to disregard that part. And we're just going to focus our attention on a restricted section. Because now that part that I highlighted in blue, see why I don't draw? It's, it's not good. Um, but the part that's highlighted in blue is a function of x, right? Every input has one single output, okay? And so then we can actually legitimately call it an inverse function. We can use the word function. So those restrictions um, basically boil down to two different cases. You can restrict in a number of different ways, but this is the way that mathematicians chose to go. I'll, I'll encapsulate it with some highlighting, okay? Okay, so if you see here, you see here that I have highlighted the right-hand half of the unit circle, and I am going to interpret that right-hand half in order to be continuous as being from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Clearly, I cannot call that angle at the bottom 3 pi over 2 because then it wouldn't be a continuous chunk, right? I'd have to say from 0 to pi over 2 comma, from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, right? That's not what I mean. So to say it in a continuous manner, we're going to call all of this from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and the three trig functions that I correspondingly highlighted in the same color, those are the ones that have that span, okay? So arc sine, arc tan, arc cosecant, okay? And if you think about it, hmm, those all have something in common. They are odd functions, odd functions, okay? And you can see there's a little bit of like, um, if you're including those endpoint values or if you have any sort of exclusion, that's just domain restrictions to make sure you're not doing things like dividing by zero, okay? That's not really super duper important for us right now. Don't worry about that super much, okay? True, but not to be obsessed about, okay? Let's look at the other case. Okay, so the other case obviously is the other three, and this would be a restriction going from zero to pi, okay? That's nice and continuous as it stands, and that would be for our functions that are even functions. So our cosine, our, our cosine and secant and cotangent are all even functions, so our cosine, our secant, our cotangent, okay? All right, so that is a very quick reminder. Let's take a look at the kinds of problems that you remember from math analysis. So this says evaluate without a, a calculator, arc sine of negative a half, okay? Now we're going to have a story about Mrs. Lemke as a young person, okay? I know it's really a long time ago, candles, you know, horse-drawn buggies, all that. Um, no, but back in, I would say this was the summer of maybe 1980. 86, somewhere around there. Um, I was taking summer school trig because I had gotten off of the typical course sequence, long story. And so my very good friend, uh, T, his name actually is T. He is of Vietnamese descent. Okay, so that's how you spell his first name. And he is a very um, wonderful mathematician who works out in Virginia now. And but at the time, we were both just teenagers, and we're in the summer school trig class. And I remember getting really, really stuck on arc sine and turning to my friend T and being like, hey, dude, uh, what the heck? 
And he just told me the best thing ever. He said, read this as the angle whose sine is, and then whatever the number is. And that is just brilliant. Good job. See, I can see why you got a PhD in mathematics. Okay, so so T always reminds me. I, this always sticks in my head. I've told so many teenagers over the course of my teaching career about T telling me this while we were in uh, summer school trip together. Um, so this is asking me to find the angle whose sine is negative a half. And because arc sine has this restriction that I've highlighted here in purple, I'm only looking in the purple zone. Okay, so although there's an angle over here whose sine, like over here in quadrant three, whose sine is negative a half, that is not the one I want. I want this guy. Okay, and that guy is negative pi over six. Why didn't I call it 11 pi over six? Because of those restrictions we just talked about, you're right, we're thinking about this in one continuous piece, so it has to be thought of as being from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Got to pick a number in the zone, okay? There are four more questions in your notes that I would like you to try, okay? Pause the video, come back in a sec. Okay, these are the answers that you should have. I don't think it is super valuable for me to necessarily go through all of those, but if... You pause right now and look at anything that you got wrong and can't figure it out. You need to talk to your teacher or at minimum your best friend from calculus who might be your teacher, but you know, also could be just a classmate. Just a classmate. How? Oh, that was a little offensive, Mrs. Lumpke. Okay. Um, but make sure that you know how to do these. Okay. It's not super pivotal. Okay. But it is good for you to know things. I like knowing things. Okay, all right, so this is still in the zone of things from math analysis. You had questions like this, okay? So this is saying simplify without a calculator. Great, I don't want to have to find my calculator anyway, so good job. Secant of the angle whose tangent is, see, I'm doing the T thing, right? It helps. The angle whose tangent is negative three-fifths. Okay, so angle whose tangent is negative three-fifths. I remember that arc tangent is one of those that is defined over on the left side of the coordinate, or excuse me, right side of the coordinate plane. Nothing is defined on the, just the left side. That's kind of great, great. Okay, so over on the right side, and since it's negative tangent, it must be down here because everything's positive in quadrant one. Okay, all right, and so tangent, opposite, adjacent. Okay, so the angle whose tangent is that, I'm going to call that angle theta. And I'm going to put a theta right in my picture. This rotation is theta. Okay, the angle whose tangent is theta, right, here's my reference angle for that. And then I want to say, all right, find the secant of that angle. Find the secant of that angle. If I do Pythagorean theorem, this side is root 34. If you said four, you just fell into the trap. That is a typical Lemke trying to trap the geometry kids issue, right? Making you think it's a three, four, five. That would only be the case if I were on the hypotenuse, my dudes. Okay, so secant, and I want to think here about reciprocal of hypotenuse. Reciprocal hypotenuse, I just said. Reciprocal of cosine, what am I doing? Which is hypotenuse over adjacent. I'm recording this so early in the morning, you guys. I think I need more coffee. Okay, so there we go. That's that guy. I should have just used the pre-written slide. Okay, so for the next one, I want to think about the angle whose sine is 5 over 13. That's a positive sign, and so I'm going to use quadrant one. I'm going to draw this picture, five over 13. Now that actually is a triple. That has a 12 right there, okay? So if I called this theta, I'd have cosine of theta. Oh, let's just finish this. That's just 12 over 13 and we're done. Okay, so the angle whose sine is that, that is what I'm calling the theta and the cosine came down, right? I just renamed the angle whose sine is. All right, now this is getting a little more spicy, right? Because now we've got an X, okay? I also have weird italicization, italis, I have weird ita italics, 
<laughs> I can't talk. Okay, let's call this angle theta as we have been. Okay, so the angle whose secant is x. I don't know if x is positive or negative, so without loss of generality, as they say, I'm just going to put it in quadrant one and say, hey, oh, x would have to be positive with where it is. That's true. Okay, because it's a hypotenuse side. Okay, now this side, if you do Pythagorean theorem, it's going to be x squared minus 3 squared. Square root of that, right? If you have the missing side, missing side plus 3 squared equals x squared. Solve for a. Okay, gotcha. All right, so then I've got tangent of that angle. Here's my angle. Tangent of that angle would be the weird square root thing over 3. Now, this actually does get used in what we're about to do. Okay, so guess what? This is now the end of math analysis recap. Okay, so here is the new lesson, 11 minutes in. I see, this is what I mean. I knew this was going to be a long video. Okay, so what is the derivative of arc sine? Okay, so this is certainly something that we need to know because we want to know derivatives and integrals of as many things as possible. Um, the more we know, the less we have to figure out later. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, so let y equal arc sine of u. If that's true, right, this is the angle whose sine is u. So that means sine of y has to be u, right? This is what sine and arc sine mean relative to each other, right, inverse functions. Okay, so now if you write that, then we can just differentiate using implicit differentiation. So we get cosine of y, chain rule, okay, equals, I'm differentiating with respect to x, okay, so I should have set that up here. u is a function of x. which means u equals blah, 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 somewhere there's an x in it, okay? Some expression with x in it. Okay, I should have said that, I'm sorry. Okay, so cosine of y dy dx equals the derivative of u with respect to x, okay? So with that in mind, actually, not with that in mind, with the previous thing in mind right here, we should draw a picture, okay? So here... I know that my angle is y, and sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So if I were to do that, I can see that this is the triangle to which we are referring. And then I do that neat little Pythagorean theorem thing, 1 squared minus u squared, square root of that, to get an expression for the third side. That's why we did this problem, okay? We were trying to set up this idea. All right, so now with that picture, I think I can do something with the stuff that's in red, okay? Oh my goodness, I just was trying to get a different colored pen. Okay, you would think I'd be better at this. You know, what is it, week 13? All right, cosine of y, cosine of y. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. I love that the hypotenuse is one, so then I can just say the adjacent side. I'm looking right now, my eyeballs are over here. Looking. That's a really <laughs> face. Yes, I'm sitting in a room talking to myself and I'm cracking myself up. Yes, don't judge. Okay, so we're looking up here. Okay, and so, um, yeah, that's where I got that expression from. Okay, and then the dy dx. Oh, that's what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find the derivative. And then over here I have du dx. Okay, so really not a lot happened in that line. However, look at what we're going to do now. We're going to solve for dy dx. We're going to have this. Oh, well that looks like a uh, formula, guys. Okay, so look at this. You start with arc sine. If you start with arc sine, you get this. So here's the fact, okay? There's the derivation in the middle, but there's a formula if I would like to hold on to that. Okay, now could I always derive this? Sure. And in fact, like in this, <laughs> just to be real, okay, in this particular unit, you might want to have this like in your head, but if it falls out of your head by May and you're taking your AP test, it's not the biggest of deals because can't you just derive it again? Yeah. Okay, now you're going to be using it a ton in this unit, so props, you want to 
just, you know, kind of have it at least in like semi long term memory. But if it doesn't stay in long, long term memory, you always could draw a triangle and refigure. OK, so find the derivative or try to find the derivative of arctan. Do the same exact kind of thing. OK, so how did we start that again? We started out with saying y equals arc sine u. So let's now have y equals arc tan of u. Then rewrite it with tangent. Then use implicit. Have a triangle picture. Okay, I'm about to leave you to do this. Okay, you pause. You do it. Don't cheat. Don't look ahead. See if you can do it. You do better in this class if you decide you're going to do better in this class. And that means working hard, which means pausing during the video and not taking shortcuts. Speech over. Okay, your derivation should look like this, or like uh, this, okay? Uh, the u prime, you probably wrote du dx, because that's what I did on the previous question. I think that's maybe a little better. I don't know, I'm not a huge fan of the prime notation in a lot of situations. Um, maybe that's another sign of aging, though. When I was your age, I loved the prime thing. But Leibniz notation, you guys, really has everything going for it. Okay, now let's look at our cosine, okay? So we can seriously do it the same way that we did the other ones, but I'm also going to use this as a springboard to discuss why we don't have to do six proofs. I know you're excited. I'm excited not to have to do six proofs, okay? That's good. Okay, so the way that we could look at would be the way that we've done all the others. Right, but y equal r cosine, rearrange it so you don't have inverse trig functions, take the derivative of both sides, okay? And this is great because at the end, gosh, it looks really familiar. You know what? It's the same as what we got for arc sine, except there's a negative. So you might be like, huh, why did that happen? Right, why is it the same, but just a difference in SIGN kind of sign? Well, is there a relationship between arc cosine and arc sine? Maybe. Hmm. So why do we call trig functions? Like, we really only have three words. And it's a matter of whether or not there's a co in the front. Okay, so sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent. Why do we do that? Okay, well, there are a plethora of reasons, but one way that we can explain it is that the CO comes from the word complementary. And so we know that there are those cofunction identities that have to do with complementary angles. You get complementary angles in a right triangle, right? If this is whatever, this is 90 degrees minus whatever. Oh my gosh, I used degrees in calculus. Shh, don't tell people. Okay, I better erase. Covey's going to judge me. There we go. That feels better. Okay, so. If one angle is theta, the other angle would be pi over 2 minus theta. Yes? Yes. Okay. So if we think about that, maybe that helps us understand where the negative comes from. Because I know that sine of pi over 2 minus something would be the same as cosine of that something. Right? Let's put a y in place of the theta. I don't know why I keep changing variables. Just to screw with you, maybe. Okay, so let's start with this idea fresh, okay? So let's say we're looking at proving our cosine, which I recognize we already did. We did it the typical way back here, okay? But let's see if we can figure out why the derivative of arc sine and the derivative of arc cosine are the same except for the negative on the arc cosine. Okay, so if we rearrange that like we typically do, but then instead we use that cofunction identity. Okay, that's what I did right there. Then instead of implicit differentiation at this point, let's remember that we've already figured out what the derivative of arc sine is. So reorganize that and now take the derivative. Well, what's the derivative of pi over 2? That's zero because that's a constant. The derivative of negative y would be negative dy dx. The derivative of arc sine of u is that thing we figured out before, the one over square root one minus u squared. So I get this negative that I could throw onto the other side. So would this be the same 
for other pairs of call functions, right? Here I had cosine, I switched it to sine. If I had cosecant, could I switch over to secant in the same kind of way with the pi over 2 minus the angle? Yeah. So for all the pairs of cofunctions, we could do this sort of derivation, which means I don't need to go and do this hoop de hoo with all of the other trig functions. You can, okay, but you don't have to because they're all going to be pair, paired up, okay? So in, think about sine and cosine, tangent and cotangent, secant and cosecant, okay? So they all go with their co-function partner and then it's actually arc whatever, okay, or inverse whatever. And the co ones, the arc cosine, arc co, arc co, that's a weird thing to say, arc co whatever. <laughs> um, those are the ones that carry the negatives, okay? Now, there is a little chunk down here where they talk about having absolute value, and this is not a fully consistent situation. Um, so they point out here that you have absolute value in arc secant because inverse secant is has a positive slope at every value in its domain. I really don't think I've seen very many questions that utilize this last pair. Okay, so don't be totally spazzy about that. There's a little inconsistency among mathematicians. I've seen some problems in other websites where that absolute value is missing. Let's not be like sweating over that, okay? Um, I do think it's correct. I'm teaching you what I think is correct, but um, yeah, but just don't don't panic if you see a problem. Like if you look up something on the internet and they have a solution and there's no absolute value, know that that's just a, a math fight that's going on, okay? So what I'd like you to do in the notes is to try four, five, six, seven. You can draw a triangle for each and try to like do a derivation each time. Or you can just draw out the triangle, and all I'm going to do when you come back is sort of flip through the answers, and then that will be the end of what I'm going to call part one, because I think I need to go get another cup of coffee before recording the rest of this. So it's going to be a part one, part two situation, okay? I know it's long. I'm sorry, okay? Uh, it's the last lesson of the whole semester. Get psyched, okay? All right, so pause this, do four through seven, come back, okay? Maybe you get a cup of coffee, too. Okay, I hope you tried first, okay? You got to actually try in order to do well in this class, you guys. It's not magic, okay? It's math. Hard to tell the difference sometimes, but you still just got to try, okay? All right, so uh, four and five, I would expect you have the highlighted versions. If you tidied up more than that in number four, that's fine, but make sure you do it right. Here's our answer for six, the, off, uh, the not often used arc secant. You can leave it messy, like the version I have highlighted. If you feel like you want to simplify, absolute value around e to the 2x. e to the 2x is always positive, so it can indeed cancel e to the 2x on the top because it is actually going to be the same. All right, and exponent rules inside the radical. All right, power to a power, you multiply the exponents. And number seven. It looks like a strange emphasis on the negative because um, that didn't copy well from when I was make, taking a snapshot, so there's a little emphasis on the negative there. Um, you can leave it in the yellow. Totally fine to have something messy like that, um, but if you don't want to do that, you can tidy up half the blue. All right. Hopefully you did great on that. If you did not do great on that, please reach out for help. Don't just flounder about or think it's going to go away. All right, the math is not going to go away. Get help if it's a struggle, okay? All right, so this ends uh, part one. Get psyched for part two, the integration part. Super fun. Bye-bye.